All right, I'm in the beautiful city of Haarlem and today I am visiting the uh, International Conference on Psychedelic Research. Psychedelic research is booming. Worldwide there are a dozens of large clinical trials to research how psychedelic therapy can be applied to treat, for instance, anxiety, depression, PTSD, fear of death amongst patients of cancer or HDHD. Now the ICPR conference brought together an international science community of over a thousand scientists. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to Harlem for this fifth edition of ICPR. I think this is probably the biggest psychedelic scientific conference dedicated to psychedelics uh, globally. And I'm, I'm nuancing it by saying that it's a scientific conference, so we are strictly focused on, on, uh, on science. But it's a, I think it's a, it's a big conference. These are 1,100 people who came from all over the world because they're interested in, in psychedelic research and therapy. Just to know what we're talking about, always good to start with a definition. Well, it's this definition is the actual scientific definition that was in Goodman and Gilman's Pharmacological Basis of Therapeutics in the 7th and 8th edition. These are drugs that produce changes in thought and mood that normally you only experience if you're dreaming or if you're having a religious exaltation, a religious experience. So they're a very unique set of compounds. No other drugs have this particular kind of effect. Now in this video, I'd like to focus on that last characterization, the fact that psychedelics can induce mystical type or metaphysical experiences. And they do that so powerfully that people coming out of psychedelic trips report a change in beliefs, a change in worldviews. Now there's more evidence, and it's pretty decent evidence, I think, that there can be some shifts in metaphysical beliefs. So this is by uh, Chris Timmerman et al. And what they show is uh, beliefs like this. Here are two examples of items uh, relating to uh, non-naturalism. Uh, that these beliefs actually do seem to shift in the direction of a kind of non-naturalism. A shift towards non-naturalism. Put a bit more bluntly, an atheist, after having a high-dose psychedelic trip with a strong mystical type experience, might come to the conclusion that God exists after all. Zeus. Who? Greek God. Or Ra, or Ganesh. No, not those ones, the real one in the Bible. Yahweh. Just God. Sorry, I couldn't help to just squeeze this funny dialogue in from the show Afterlife. Um, and YouTube lets uh, filmmakers do this if it's under fair use policy, so if it's relevant to what you're discussing. And it is relevant because we're seeing here a funny uh, metaphysical dialogue <coughs> between an atheist and someone who clearly believes in God. The thing is when it comes to psychedelics is that metaphysics and beliefs are now in a way entering psychiatry. If a patient comes out of a trip um, and talks to a psychiatrist, for instance, a week later saying, I feel this huge improvement in my mental health due to this mystical experience of oneness I feel felt at home in the universe or I met God. If a therapist would respond in a slightly condescending way saying that, oh, that's nice that that hallucination did that for you, it could potentially harm the therapy because many people attribute their improvement in mental health after psychedelic trips with mystical type experiences exactly to the fact that what they have experienced felt real or sometimes even more real than real. And this is why the World Psychiatric Association now has set up guidelines when it comes to metaphysics. But the World Psychiatric Association does encourage uh, exploration uh, of these beliefs if they come up uh, from the patient or participant or client side. So it's important, I think, to address these beliefs if they're brought up. However, uh, there's also a statement, which I very much agree with, that psychiatrists should not use their professional position uh, to proselytize either for non-naturalistic religious spiritual beliefs or against them. So that's the view of the WPA. Okay, so psychiatrists or psychologists guiding psychedelic trips should be metaphysically agnostic, but they cannot be agnostic in an 
ignorant kind of way. Because if you want to really guide people who've had a profound experience, you should be able to say more than, I don't know what you saw and I don't know what it means. Philosopher Peter Schustedt Hughes proposed setting up a metaphysical menu. If you, um, if someone's had um, a metaphysical experience, um, then they are, I would imagine, more uh, likely to dismiss it if they haven't been given certain options, like a menu of metaphysics, as it were, in, in which to sort of frame what they've perceived. They might think, wow, I just thought time wasn't real or something, how stupid, you know, like, and, then, and thus it perhaps won't um, be as significant to that person. But if you tell them that actually the metaphysics of time is very complex and uh, timelessness uh, has got things going for it, um, you might, be, might take that experience uh, more profoundly. It's a conjecture, so there's no proof for it, but perhaps uh, a trial could be made, a speculation. So what psychedelic therapy needs is a metaphysical menu, giving you different modes to interpret the psychedelic experience. And this is also the moment to make an ethical statement in this video. Um, at the Essentia Foundation, we share science relevant to metaphysical idealism or analytical idealism. And we hold the view that that's the most plausible metaphysics. But that does not mean that we fully agree with the World Psychiatric Association, namely that therapists guiding the psychedelic experience should be metaphysically agnostic. Of course, it's impossible to not hold any personal beliefs, but in guiding people who ask questions, a therapist, a good therapist, should just offer different metaphysical modes of interpreting um, their trip. But I guess what our role is as uh, the Essentia Foundation is to just cook you a good idealist dish on the metaphysical menu of interpreting um, psychedelic experiences. Now this is also the moment to warn you a little bit because if you really want something easy digestible I suggest you first search YouTube for trip report higher dimensions meeting God stuff like that it will give you great videos this is something else the metaphysics and the interpretation of the psychedelic trip as discussed on the ICPR conference is a more uh, like a ut cuisine it's a um, a bit more difficult, but I will try and make it fun. I will get the Bexkirkene uh, Dojeflusion effects. Absolutely, brilliant choice. And for you, ma'am. Yeah, I'm going to do the Vigerti Louis Ver menu, but can you hold the Gurbuk Salhutne? Hold the Gurbuk Salhutne, absolutely. And for you, sir. Ah, uh, sorry, I'm actually just struggling with the menu a little bit. Oh, yeah, same. Like, I don't know if I should... Descriptions of the psychedelic experience that make sense to one person can sound like jabberish to another. You know, I really think this is a funny thing, but if if all the people that took acid, you know, when the people that I know that have taken acid, we can look out at the other people that haven't, and they can they can tell us we're crazy, and we can say, well, you haven't seen anything yet, because there are things that are more beautiful. Now the discourse this young psychonet uses I think is exemplary for the 60s and 70s when uh, the use of psychedelic substances became highly politicized. Timothy Leary saying tuning drop out. The result was a strong political backlash against psychedelics and against psychedelic research. I began the meeting by making this statement which I think needs to be made to the nation. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. All funding for research programs stopped, the war on drugs started, and nowadays in what is called the psychedelic renaissance, you can still sense, um, in a way, a trauma of what happened 50 years ago, in a sense that we really should be careful in how we now talk about psychedelics, um, especially if we want to integrate them clinically. But that does not mean that it isn't relevant um, from an historical perspective to take into account everything that was written about psychedelics even though we now regard stuff written as uh, political esoteric you name it um, it is of value now it feels safe to say that almost all of the early pioneers in the field of psychedelics so the thinkers the scientists in uh, the 50s and 60s from Aldous Huxley to Timothy Leary Richard Alpert, later known as Ramdas, uh, 
Terence McKenna and later uh, someone like James Fadiman, all implicitly or explicitly lean towards a non-physicalist interpretation of the psychedelic experience. I thereby mean that they all seem to agree that the experience you have is not merely produced by your brain, but somehow you connect to a consciousness larger than your own ego consciousness. All of these thinkers had different words for that, but uh, metaphysically you could sort of group them together um, in this non-physicalist or even um, idealist interpretation of the psychedelic experience. Huxley on masculine. The suggestion is that the function of the brain and nervous system and sense organs is in the main eliminative and not productive. Um, according to such a theory, each one of us is potentially mind at large. With the doors of perception, Huxley popularized the reduction valve hypothesis, the idea that our brains uh, reduce a larger consciousness, mind at large, to our ego consciousness. That idea, I think, has some philosophical problems of its own, but it surely is not physicalist in the strict sense. Absolute classic, not uncontested in the psychedelic community because uh, these early pioneers, Timothy Leary and Richard Albert, definitely went esoteric and political, but nonetheless uh, widely read, the Vedic sages knew the secret, the Eleusinian initiates knew it, the tantrics knew it. In all their esoteric writings, they whispered the message it is possible to cut beyond ego consciousness, to tune in on neurological processes which flash by at the speed of light, and to become aware of the enormous treasury of ancient knowledge welded into the nucleus of every cell in your body. Modern psychedelic chemicals provide a key to this forgotten realm of awareness. More or less a modern classic, The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide by James Fadiman, now uh, famous for his microdosing protocols, who writes in a chapter called The Qualities of Transcendent Experience. Um, basically, therefore, there is simply nothing to worry about because you yourself are the eternal energy of the universe playing hide and seek off and on with itself. At root, you are the Godhead with a capital G, for God is all there is. From an idealist metaphysics, many of these uh, classic interpretations of the psychedelic experience make a lot of sense um, because they seem to suggest that on the psychedelic substances, you somehow can tap into or experience for a brief moment a consciousness larger than your own that has um, a ontic status that is real. It's not fabricated by your own mind or brain um, it's really out there and you can tap into it but saying something like that it's out there and you can tap into it is unscientific language and i can also see the problems with it it's highly esoteric um, and the question is if we really progress psychedelic therapy if uh, we use words like this um, so in the debate i followed at the icpr conference there was this pushback from people saying we need to demystify psychedelic science. For instance, there's this thing called the MEQ, the Mystical Experience Questionnaire, that asks questions like, on a scale from one to five, did you experience the oneness of everything? And with questions like these, some scientists say, we are framing the experience in a mystical way, and you get results um, that suggests that many people had mystical type experiences, but did they really have those experiences or did we just ask questions that frame their experience in that way? Um, many of these studies use, use measures like the MEQ, which was mentioned, or other common measures of mystical experience. What are they really measuring? Do they really reliably capture some uniquely relevant features of the psychedelic experience, which we would appropriately call mystical, mystical experience? And finally, which others will also probably touch upon quite a bit is, if we do these studies and we include these measures of mystical experience, are we encouraging people to put their experiences, whether they're patients or just volunteers, in a mystical framework? And if we are, is that a good thing? I'll leave that to others to, to consider. So, what to do then? I think we should demystify our concepts. 
What we need to do is we need to explicate the experiences we are trying to describe. We should be very explicit, we should be very specific, and we should be really teasing them apart and figuring out what is going on. Uh, importantly, we need to separate experiences from beliefs. I talked about this already, I think it's extremely important. Then we need terminology that everybody understands in the same way. No more ultimate reality, no more. <clears throat> and importantly, and I mean, I really hope that everyone already is doing this personally, but we need to do it more explicitly as well. We need to disassociate psychedelics from supernaturalism and divinity and vagueness and crystal healing. This speaker referred to a Forbes cover story about psychedelics, which had an image of crystal healing accompanying the story. And he didn't really, I think, imply that anyone in the psychedelic community associates the psychedelic experience with crystal healing. But the plea here is to demystify the psychedelic experience, to not talk about fundamental reality, mind at large, oneness, etc. Everything that you can read in the more classical interpretations that I shared earlier in this video. So demystifying it. But in doing so, I think the metaphysical debate in the psychedelic community uses confusing terms. Instead of opposing the more idealist interpretation of the experience um, to a physicalist one, a materialist one, they use the term naturalism. If, for instance, you read this book, The Philosophy of Psychedelics by Tim Latherby, a book widely respected in the research community and mentioned a lot at the conference, we can read how uh, naturalism uh, boils down to physicalism. All mental phenomena are to be accommodated within the framework of nature as it is understood by the natural sciences. What Latherby does in this book is exactly to go against sort of all the classical books I just uh, uh, quoted from uh, when he says this. These experiences render many who undergo them incredulous that consciousness could be mere quote unquote neural information processing. But undermining this inference is one of the central burdens of this book. And um, he calls that naturalizing the entheogenic conception. So the aim here is to bring um, the psychedelic experience within a physicalist framework, uh, using the word naturalism instead of physicalism. But as I mentioned earlier, I don't see it as my task to serve you the dish of the, uh, on the metaphysical menu of the physicalist interpretation of the psychedelic experience to sort of dive into how we could explain that it all comes down to neurochemistry and it's produced, fabricated within your uh, brain. I think that that view is highly problematic and in understanding the psychedelic experience, it's much more fruitful to build upon the classical literature out there, but to just add more analytical rigor to it. And um, at the conference, uh, the ICPR conference, I met a philosopher who does exactly that and who also critiques the notion of naturalism as proposed by physicalists, basically, in imp interpreting the um, uh, psychedelic experience. And his name was Yusi Yilka. I would like to, I would like to walk when I talk. So, naturalism and mysticism in psychedelic science, it's a large, maybe too large topic, but I try to cover a, a central aspect. So, uh, we have seen a tension between what we could, could be called mysticism and naturalism in psychedelic science, that mystical type experiences are uh, metaphysical hallucinations or elephant in the living room of psychedelic science. On the other hand, we have uh, scholars who argue that these are potentially veridical insights about the nature of reality, or this is reflected in the entheogenic conception of psychedelics, to reveal the God within. So here I would like to focus on the comforting delusions objection by Chris Leatherby, which holds that uh, these metaphysical aspects or insights of mystical experience, they are false because they contradict with naturalism. The comforting delusion objection is something uh, first mentioned by Michael Pollan in this book called How to Change Your Mind, which is becoming a modern classic when it comes to psychedelic, an absolutely great investigation. 
Pollen right, for instance, we bump into one of the richer paradoxes of the psilocybin trials. While it succeeds in no small part because it has the sanction and authority of science, its effectiveness seems to depend on a mystical experience that leaves people convinced there is more to this world than science can explain. Science is being used to validate an experience uh, validate an experience that would appear to undermine the scientific perspective. This comforting delusion objection is a difficult one. Um, so you're saying people are experiencing something science supposedly says is not real. Mind at large, uh, oneness, um, God. So science says, supposedly, it's not real, and but science does prove that experiencing it really helps to cure people. And then the ethical question Michael Pollan raises is, should you then uh, facilitate that? Should you do that? Uh, because uh, you're instilling, so to speak, um, a false belief in people's minds. In his talk at the ICPR, Yusei Yilka critiques this comforting delusion objection by sort of unraveling the argument. So to answer, to know whether this is so or not, we need to know what is naturalism and uh, what are the mystical insights. So uh, really briefly, I take it that the metaphysical core of mystical type experiences, uh, some kinds of mystical experiences is that there is a fundamental unitary nature of reality that is beyond the sensory world and that can be known directly. For example, this can be conceptualized as some kind of white light, universal love or cosmic consciousness or God as the underlying reality that underlies this sensory reality. So if people come out of a trip really believing what they saw, God, the oneness, the white light is real, should we do it? Because from a physicalist perspective, it's delusional. Michael Pollan is a journalist and not a philosopher. Uh, so in his book, he doesn't really answer this question. He doesn't really solve this dilemma. And uh, this book by Tim Latherby, The Philosophy of Psychedelics, is all about solving that comforting delusion objection. But before diving into how that argument is exactly built up, let's first go into the whole term naturalism. And then, now, what is naturalism? Uh, it's quite common to think that uh, naturalism uh, consists of two main theses, an epistemological and ontological component. The epistemological is that our ways of knowing reality or nature should be compatible with science. And the ontological component is that all is physical. So this is important figure. We need to clearly distinguish between scientific naturalism and real naturalism. Scientism means the thesis that uh, scientific knowledge uh, is all knowledge. We cannot have any other type of knowledge except for scientific knowledge. If you say that the only knowledge we can gain about nature is through the scientific method, then the contents of the psychedelic experience do not count as knowledge because the mystical type experiences are not uh, verifiable. They cannot be modeled and replicated in how we usually do science. So then they must be a hallucination. But Yuka proposes a much broader definition of naturalism in which there is a form of knowledge that is not scientific knowledge. But then again, real naturalism, this comes from Galen Strawson, it holds that all knowledge, uh, like knowledge is a wider class than just scientific knowledge. Uh, in reality, it's highly likely that we have knowledge that is true knowledge, but not scientific knowledge. So the class of knowledge is wider than scientific knowledge. For example, I know what it's like to be here. And it's not scientific knowledge, I just know it. I know what this coffee tastes like. I just taste it and I say it's, it tastes like this. And it's basically ineffable kind of knowledge. I have previously call this unitary knowledge. Uh, there is an article in this Philosophy and Psychedelics book on that. It's the same kind of knowledge that uh, is emphasized in these uh, Zen meditative experiences where there is, no, uh, there is no like dichotomy between subject and object. There is just the consciousness being present without the subject even knowing, like being aware that they are conscious. They, they just exist in some very, like some, some primordial sense of being conscious. 
because if I say that speaking at the table, discussing with you, I didn't think in that way like a moment ago. This was just a conceptualization of my experience. It was already a model, a picture of the experience. So this results in the question of how can I know uh, existence, consciousness here without modeling it, like without calling this a discussion or philosophizing and so on. And the answer is that it's, it's all the time present. Like consciousness in itself, the fundamental nature of my own individual consciousness at least, it's present every single moment. This is it, like all the time. But we fail to know, uh, like pay attention to it because we are so accustomed. You could uh, like say that we have these like priors in the predictive coding neuroscience that which in enable us to feel that everything's familiar. I have like schemas of conduct and uh, like how we behave in this situation. I don't start like dancing on the table or anything like that. But it, it somehow like uh, wheels or like hides the essence of consciousness in itself because we just think, oh, we are discussing. But what is this discussion really? Like this, this thinking process here. This I think is a really important point. We are conscious beings. That is undeniable. And as conscious beings, we are also rational beings who make models of the world. And those models, in a certain sense, limit our understanding of reality. Our brains are predicting instruments. They uh, compare incoming sensory data to previous experiences we have. And in that process, um, we live, you could say, inside our models for most of the time. And to me personally, it's interesting to look at brains that are less evolved. So look at the baby brain. Oh yeah, oh, the, the, the phenomenon of object permanence, that a baby so, sort of somehow yeah. learns that when daddy or mom, I, I noticed with my own child, it's a funny process, right? When he first starts yeah. smiling, when I, I hide yeah. behind the door, he gets to it. Him, and then he gets it, he is still there. Yeah. And so that's object permanence, but we have to learn that yeah. sort of. But maybe his, and that was just a hypothesis I have, maybe his form of consciousness, when I do not see my dad, he is not there, is maybe yeah. the more pure form of consciousness um, in the yeah. fact that uh, it is all an idea, in a sense. Yeah. I, I basically agree. And Alison Gopnik is a psychologist uh, who says that children are babies are essentially in a psychedelic state all the time because they don't have the high-level concepts and like priors which shape, narrow down their experience of the world. Essentially, what you see, and most of the psychedelic in investigators have argued for the same thing, Essentially, you see that what the effect of psychedelics is to return the brain to this childhood state of plasticity and openness. So this is a, a slide showing that under the influence of something like psilocybin, you have many more local connections and fewer of these pruned long distance connections. So this is just the opposite of what you would see in the course of, uh, of development. So in a sense, the psychedelic state is maybe the baby state state in which we had a pure conscious experience of the world around us, but no models to model it, capture it, remember it. So we forgot. Why do we have these concepts? Why have we evolved into this kind of animal with these kinds of concepts? Because, well, being in a pure conscious state is not very adaptive, like for a long term, we need to seek food and uh, sexual partners and so on. So evolution has shaped us into this form and all animals have concepts in this like basic sense that they have models of reality. Even bacteria have models of reality, at least according to the predict predictive coding framework. It's the tragedy of human existence that we are limited beings and we need to model beings which are not identical with us. So we are limited into this like a bit like platonic cave of shadows due to our being finite beings with borders. So when I'm not existing like before my birth there is no use there is just this soup of reality and then Yussi emerges, and that means that the border uh, of Yussi emerges. Like uh, there emerges this entity which has borders with other 
parts of reality and it's like this entity here. And then at that, at that moment, when reality becomes a single organism, it becomes somehow like in this paradoxical situation of being still part of the reality, like a wave in the sea. It's just a form of energy, a form of matter, however you say about it. Uh, and um, it's still part of that same ocean, but then it's also separate. And it's uh, like left in this like, it ultimately it can lead to this Cartesian like uh, alienation from the world where we start like wondering, does the external world exist? And like we can, uh, these skeptical scenarios. And that's the tragedy because only we, we only have the models and then we can like start like doubting, is there anything beyond the models? Is there like reality at large at all? Yeah. That's the tragedy. And then when we die, we dissolve into this soup again. We become one with that, but it's false to say because then it's, there is no longer I that would be one with the larger. But it's somehow like we are one and then we become separate and then we become one again. Now, I just finished a documentary on bacteria, which will come out, I think, next year. And that really helped me to understand that what Yuka is saying is actually quite hard from like a really physicalist biological perspective. Um, bacteria, the first organisms on our planet, um, formed a boundary between um, themselves and the outside world um, called the cell wall, right? And within the cell wall, chemical processes take place and entropy is being fought. And that's the whole story of life. We are a bunch of cells and collectively those cells make up the human body. And the human body relies on model making. It relies on uh, navigating that whole bunch of cells <laughs> in this world to fight off entropy and to um, find food, to reproduce, and then we die and <laughs> the boundaries are dissolved, the entropy goes up and in a sense you return to the oneness, right? Um, and this is the human condition. We're trapped in models, models that we need to navigate uh, this bunch of cells <laughs> in this uh, world. Um, now in uh, psychedelic research and uh, in the thinking, um, and philosophy of psychedelics, it's interesting that very early on um, there was someone who was all about saying that these substances were about boundary dissolution. So in a sense that they opened up to uh, higher entropy, they broke down our mental models. And the person who sort of really was all about this message was Terence McKenna. If you look at thousands of these experiences, is they dissolve boundaries. They dissolve boundaries between you and your past, you and the part of your unconscious you don't want to look at, between you and your partner, between you and the feminine if you're masculine and vice versa, between you and the world, all the boundaries that we put up to keep ourselves from feeling our circumstance are dissolved. Um, at Imperial College in London, people on psychedelic substances were put in a brain scanner and the regions in the human brain associated with model making, with memory, with self uh, reference, so you thinking about who you are, sort of making up your story of the world, and not sort of having this purely uh, conscious experience of the world, but sort of being in these models, that region in the brain, the activity is uh, significantly reduced on almost all psychedelic substances. Robin Carhart Harris and his colleagues have shown that those prefrontal control systems that we think are so great and are really great if you actually have to go out into the world and do things, actually become deactivated under the influence of uh, of psychedelics. So if you think about childhood, childhood, it looks as if what the psychedelics are doing is putting your brain back into a neurological state and I think also an experiential state, a phenomenological state, which is like that state of advanced plasticity um, and exploration that you see 
from childhood. And I think any of you who've hung out with babies or three-year-olds, this will kind of make sense. Um, there's a lot, you could sort of summarize baby consciousness by saying it's a lot of, oh, wow, right? There's a lot of, oh, wow, for babies. And the really big and cool question, I think, is then, can you, in that psychedelic state, with less models going on, with, let's say, a more pure consciousness, gain knowledge that is veridical, that can tell us something meaningful about nature? Or in other words, is this oh wow experience that babies have of the world without any mod models a form of knowledge about the world? And what if that knowledge isn't only knowledge about shiny objects like keys or, or maybe their dummy or their own fingers, but about entities? I think what, what most of the psychedelic community can agree upon is, is uh, I mean, uh, one way to label this is your default mode network, right? That goes down and somehow you other parts of the brain uh, get sort of a free area to play. Or we could say these models are shut down and I can, can sort of see something for the first time again. But then comes the question when I encounter entities or I have a strong sense that God or whatever you call, call it is talking to me. And then I think a lot of psychedelic researchers are sort of, uh, they highly defer in how they would label that, right? Would you uh, give those claims uh, a theoretical status? Status? I mean, that does it relate to some form of truth, or will you then just say, okay, that's where the noise in the brain, or it's just an illusion, your mind on drugs giving you these sort of signals? I mean, how to? What are your thoughts here? That's an important question. Uh, some people refer to this as spiritual bypassing, like uh, Kahat, Harris, and Friston in the Rebels model paper. Uh, I think that kind of notion is a bit like pejorative and also Letterby argues uh, that uh, these kinds of God encounter experiences would be metaphysical, metaphysical hallucinations. He explicitly thinks that uh, God is always supernatural. That's the like assumption. But if we start from the assumption of naturalism, which is basically a monistic assumption that all is one, which is like a really basic uh, common approach in Western metaphysics. Physicalism is a kind of monism and idealism is kind of monism. Neutral monism is a kind of monism. So physicalists are also monists uh, in this metaphysical sense. But now the problem of, uh, of this God encounter experience, if you consider God as something supernatural, then of course uh, if you conceptualize the God encounter in these terms, then it's not compatible with naturalism. And in that framework, it would be classified as uh, delusional. In this whole sort of debate, there's something I just cannot get my head around, but I'm trying to do this here on camera to just understand sort of this um, physicalist or, or let's say within the psychedelic community, naturalist way of saying it's a delusion. Um, okay, let's let's go a couple of steps steps back. We uh, in our normal consciousness within consciousness, we're doing science, we're making models, we predict nature, and we agree on it because we have the same experience of nature. But our starting point is experience, it's consciousness. And in psychedelic trips, we have this weird experience that when we come back, we cannot directly share. But the, the ground position that it takes place within consciousness is exactly the same as any other experience, experience on which you base science. So wouldn't it be more accurate to just say it's a form of uh, experience, um, knowledge, if you like, that I just cannot model? And that's it. And stop there and just say nothing about if it's true or not, because that philosophically feels sloppy in a sense to me. And I'm not a philosopher. This is really my intuition about uh, all of this. What helps, I think, is um, a metaphor Yuka uses based on uh, the thinking of Aldous Huxley again, the prism metaphor. So uh, this uh, aims to illustrate this idea. Uh, this is from Huxley's the prism metaphor that uh, like the fundamental nature of reality is some kind of white light that is like uh, as in a prism uh, it's transformed into colors of our human consciousness. 
So this colored sphere is human consciousness and our models of reality are just one small part of that consciousness and then all of this is part of nature. Okay, let's for a moment stay in this prism metaphor. Say in a psychedelic experience, you experience white light. You've never experienced white light because you normally really only experience colors. And when you get back, you do not have a model. You have nothing to frame that white light to, 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 to model it in terms of the, the rest of the world you know, in terms of those colors. The only thing you could maybe say is it is as if I saw all the colors at once. And people will start laughing and because it doesn't make sense to, it, to them. But the irony here is that um, in a sense, you're saying something super accurate about nature on a different level. Um, you just cannot communicate it back in the color world, back in the world of models. And when it comes um, to discussing metaphysics in psychedelics, I think using words like mystical or, or sort of religious frameworks um, is confusing because there's this funny thing. Even people uh, who are religious, when they get out of trips, they do not report a sort of confirmation of their religious models. This one other really interesting study where they gave, I think it's ongoing, it's not published yet, but they gave psilocybin to clergy, remember, the priests. And so I remember one Protestant priest reporting that, like, as a, as a member of the clergy, he thought that he, like, is uh, talking, like, about what God is like. And then after the psilocybin experience, he became more humble that no one can know God. That uh, it's like shatters our even religious concepts of God. And I think religion is best conceived as like an image of God, uh, like uh, metaphorical and uh, trying to capture some aspects. And it would be like a huge mistake to think that the Bible is literally true or any other sacred texts. They are just like methods of trying to somehow convey this original experience. And if you forget the original experience, then you are left with nothing but these like conceptual constructs just floating in space. Now, I think from a physicalist standpoint, it can feel reassuring in a sense that people who are very religious go into a psychedelic trip and come out of it sort of doubting their religion in a sense, maybe. But if you're accurate, they are not saying their religion isn't true. They are just saying, my religion is a model and it in no way captures that which it refers to, what is modeled by the religion. And if you look at it like that, there is a painful mirror for science because science is also a model of the world. Uh, the hard problem of consciousness really comes from this uh, confounding between the model and the modeled, like our words and objects. Because uh, the physicalist quite often fails to understand that uh, they don't really know reality in itself. They think this, this is just like uh, philosophical sophistry, talking of like things in themselves. But uh, this is actually like brought into the face of the like neuroscientists and other physicalists by the predictive coding neuroscience framework. Uh, this uh, Danish philosopher Zahavi, he argues in a paper, uh, this is quite obvious point, but he, he puts it really well, that uh, the predictive coding neuroscience basically implies that we don't have access to the hidden causes of our observations. So the idea in predictive neuroscience is that our brain is like this predictive machine that tries to predict observation, sensory data, through building these generative models based on, for example, Bayesian interfe uh, inference. And our consciousness is basically this huge generative model of the surrounding reality based on sensory data. But the model is in the mind, or the model is your mind. And the mind is probably in the brain, and it doesn't have direct access to the surroundings, so the hidden cause of the observations remains unknown. And the neuroscientists like, keep saying this like it was uh, somehow not problematic at all, but they don't acknowledge that it, this applies also to their own observations and models. Like the scientist thinking of the brain. Well, the brain is just a, a thought in the scientist's mind. 
And the predictive coding framework itself is also just a model in your mind. Like all this empirical science is our, like, it's human constructs. And I don't mean that they wouldn't be true. Of course, uh, they probably re reflect to some extent the nature of reality, because otherwise it would be, would be a miracle that uh, the theories work so well, like uh, planes fly and so on. Talking to you see this deep irony dance on me. We know from neuropredictive coding that we build models and that we do not have access to reality as it really is, but we live in, in these models, right? But the physicalist then holds on to one of these models, namely the, the brain that it observes in consciousness, and says about that model, the, the brain that presents itself as physical, this one's fundamental. This model is reality also. It's independent of observation. But yes, this leads to infinite regress, basically. When, when we try to grasp the nature of reality outside our consciousness, we now I just said it, the nature of reality outside my consciousness. And when I said that, I try to refer to the nature in itself. But how can I refer it to it? Because my term nature in itself here is just a word again. So it's like a Tarskian regress, this Polish logician who showed, showed that truth cannot be defined within language. You always have to postulate the meta language to define truth. This is like logical analysis is really like uh, high rigor an analytical philosophy. But the same applies to our conscious models of reality. We just cannot like get to the reality in itself except for our own case, like this is it, in our own case, that we know it through being. So the conclusion, con conclusion is that, let there be mistaken, that the mystical type metaphysical insights can be compatible with naturalism when naturalism is not conflated with scientism. However, uh, an important point is uh, that we shouldn't like become dogmatists about our models of reality, our conceptions of reality, because they are just conceptions. The word is not the object, we only have our... They're just fictions, sort of. And if we cling to our fictions, we become like idolat... Uh, like we start to do idolatry, like uh, we worship the images instead of reality in itself. So, thank you. This is it. In this, this is it analysis of the psychedelic experience, Yuka comes very close, I think, to um, a pure form of analytical idealism in the sense that it grants the psychedelic experience a status as an experience, as something within consciousness that you experience. So it's also, in a sense, a relaxed, open, attitude to the psychedelic experience in a sense that you could take it as a form of inspiration to do science from like agnostically i just don't know it could be maybe that i spoke to uh, god or i connected to mind at large um you just have to be careful to bring that back as a sort of truth that you can model but then back to uh, this book by Latherby, the philosophy of psychedelics which is really a carefully carefully written uh, book to try to solve this comfort and delusion objection, right? The fact that we maybe shouldn't give people these metaphysical hallucinations that make them feel better because we are instilling beliefs that are false according to physicalism. The thing with this book is that towards the end of the book, um, a turn is made towards different wording and towards the philosophy of phenomenology. So the book starts out with physicalism and how to naturalize the uh, psychedelic experience. But um, near the end of the book, um, it turns towards the philo philosophy of phenomenology, but there remains sort of this difficult, slightly schizophrenic notion when Latherby ends by saying, psychedelic therapy is neither a pure low-level pharmacotherapy nor a matter of changing explicit metaphysical convictions, right? So it's not about ch changing your metaphysical convictions, but rather it's a process of deconstructing and rewriting maladaptive, largely unconscious, abstract beliefs about self and world that structure our experience. So how then is de deconstructing abstract beliefs about world that structure experience not changing metaphysical convictions? 
because these are beliefs about what the world really is, right? A metaphysical conviction. And this book starts out with a metaphysical conviction that physicalism is true, that brain states produce uh, consciousness. So in line with Yuka, I would just suggest why not apply the psychedelic model collapse that can happen, the rewriting of metaphysical beliefs to your own metaphysical belief you started with, namely physicalism. And of course, you could say exactly the same about an idealist standpoint. But from a standpoint of idealism, the problem is less acute. Because if you say consciousness is primary and fundamental, um, what the psychedelic experience shows you is exactly that. Consciousness remains. You just have to let go of any models you have about that. So from a standpoint of idealism, there isn't really a big problem. So to end this video, I think if we look at the metaphysical menu about the interpretations of the mystical type experiences psychedelics can give us, there's plenty of choice for a good idealist dish, but still not that much, that much choice when it comes to a more physicalist or naturalist interpretation. And um, maybe that, uh, should be worked on and if we really want to have um, therapy where people from all walks of life with all sort of metaphysical beliefs can uh, be serviced to sort of um, integrate these profound experiences then you should offer different worldviews but I just think as of now a more physicalist naturalist however you want to call it um, interpretation is really not that coherent. But I really hope to just contribute to the debate with this video. I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm a filmmaker that really is interested in this because I think it has such profound, um, uh, it can offer such a profound effect on the health of people and research is showing that. Well, we can know nature by being part of nature, but what role do these psychedelics play there? One could argue that when the model collapse happens, we somehow, at least what is absolutely clear is that our models of consciousness and our models of nature and matter, they start to shift. We start to question like, and it should also happen in neuroscientific theories like what is the rebus model? or uh, what is the brain. People should, they, these are like priors, these are models of reality. They, uh, people should start to question uh, in psychedelic experience, like especially emphasize there that uh, like, these are just models, but what is beyond the models? That's the question that psychedelics really bring on the surface through model collapse. I think that's a very nice way to put it, model collapse, yeah. Yeah, and then what happens when all the model co models collapse? This would be a topic for some predictive neuroscience guy and some Zen meditator, because like, uh, of course, the predictive neuroscience is just a model of reality like all else, but we could use it as a conceptual framework. Like, uh, consciousness is that generative model in, in the brain that operates on the priors. But suppose it would be possible for all the priors to collapse. That's really a problematic premise because uh, the priors are also in the retina. Like uh, this, uh, this Bayesian uh, like modeling process happens on the really low level, uh, like uh, low level already. So, but suppose that all priors collapse, what would be left? It, it would probably be like really high entropy, like informational entropy, because then the surprise would be absolute. But when is the surprise like absolute maximum? When you are here and now, maybe. That's a hypothesis, uh, like future research needed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Yusuf. It's been a great, great conversation. Yeah, really you. enjoyed this. Thank you. Yeah, we discussed for an hour. Great. Model collapse. I think it's a good thing for humanity, whether you're a religious, an atheist, a scientist, an idealist, a physicalist, back to the direct experience. This is it. If you've made it so far, 
thanks really for watching this video essay. Uh, I really love making stuff like this, but uh, what I love even more if it really helps you understanding stuff like this better. So if there's anything you think I can improve or um, stuff that is left out in this video that you'd really like to hear more about, let me know in the comments. Um, at Essentia Foundation, we will be starting uh, something new, which is um, sort of roundtable discussions I will be having with the director of our foundation, Bernardo Kastrup, um, not unknown to many of you. And I know there are questions um, I see already in the comments on YouTube uh, directed directly to Bernardo. So keep posting those and I will try to bring them to the table in upcoming videos with Bernardo. Um, for now, thanks for watching and uh, I'd appreciate it very much if you'd subscribe to our channel and uh, help us grow this uh, movement. Thanks. Mm -hmm.